Tennessee football orange and white game that is Saturday and the person that's going to be the offensive MVP is not somebody you're thinking of right now I'll tell you who and why that more to Thursday locked on balls you are locked on balls your daily podcast on the Tennessee volunteers part of the locked on podcast network your team every day What is up, everybody? Welcome into your Thursday edition of Locked On Balls. I'm your host, Eric Kane. Appreciate you for being here, making Locked On Balls your first listen each and every day, your first watch on Locked On Balls YouTube channel, where you can subscribe for absolutely free. You can download us, follow us, subscribe us, listen to us, all that and more, wherever you get your podcast for absolutely free. We're a part of Locked On Podcast Network, where it is your team every single day. All right, we're near the end of the week right now. It's Thursday. We're going to take a look at the expectations for Tennessee's offense in the orange and white game here in segment number one. We'll do defense tomorrow. And in segments two and three, we're going to catch up with my buddy Ryan Shumpert of Rocky Top Insider, talking all things Vols, spring practice, orange and white game, Tennessee basketball, roster reset, transfer portal, Tennessee baseball, all that and more is coming up right now here on Locked On Balls. So I said in the cold open that Tennessee's offensive MVP is not going to be somebody that you're expecting. And I'll tell you why. It's the spring game. Okay, and maybe you already know this, um, but for those that might be listening or watching right now, for those that might be one of the lucky 10,000 that are going to be inside Neyland Stadium or one of the many of you guys who are going to be watching on the SEC Network, it is a spring game. It is a scrimmage. I wouldn't even call it a glorified scrimmage. It's going to be super vanilla. Josh Heupel is not going to want to show anybody anything on, on television. Um, all coaches are like that. Um, a lot of the veterans... A lot of guys that you don't want to take the chance of getting beat up or might have some nagging injuries right now that you don't, don't want to put them in potential to get you know worse than that injury are not even going to play or they're going to play not so much. Um, it's going to be very boring, but at the end of the day, it's football and we get to see football and we haven't seen football in, in a little bit. So it's exciting. And of course, it's Tennessee football. And, you know, if you're watching and listening to the show, which I thank you for that. You're probably a diehard Tennessee fan. You know this roster like the back of your hand, and you want to see these newcomers and these freshmen, and you want to check out the guys in contention for that left guard battle and all that and more. So it's going to be fun and exciting. But if you're the casual fan, you're not going to see a whole lot of Nico. Okay. In fact, I I've been kind of joking all week long. Nico's going to go two for five, going to play two series, um, and then you're going to call it a day. I mean, that's going to be it. And, and that doesn't mean that he played poorly, or that doesn't mean that they're not happy with his progression or whatever. It's just, why on earth do you want to put your quarterback, your face of your franchise, if you will, your five-star quarterback, now it's this is his team, why do you want to put him in harm's way when you got kickoff five months away? Um, it just takes one play, man. Football is a contact sport. Football is a, it's a sport that anything can happen, and um, you don't want to take those chances. So Nico will play a little bit, but he's not going to play much. Cooper Mays, who's been dealing with a nagging injury all spring long, and he's so vital to your team to begin with, probably not going to play, I would imagine. John Campbell, he's been back at practice this week a little bit. I doubt he'll play, or if he does, it won't be much. Um, James Pierce, why on earth do you want to put James Pierce out there for chances to to get injured? Potentially, as our guy Max Chadwick over at, at Pro Football Focus, he could have potentially been the first defensive player drafted this year, much less next year where he might go number one overall. Why put him out there and chances to go get hurt? So point of the fact of the matter is a lot of these guys are not going to play or they're going to play not very much. Now, guys who will play young, freshmen, sophomore, early enrollees, some veterans who are contending for jobs. We're talking about that left guard spot. Jackson Lampley, you know, missed last scrimmage. He's been absent at practice a little bit. We'll see if he can go this weekend. He's very much in contention for the left guard job, as is Shamuarov, um, who was a tackle. They slid inside, and he's trying to, uh, you know, earn his stripes to be the left guard. Um, so is Dane Davis, who's the swing man, who can play tackle. He might play a little tackle in the, in the scrimmage or in the orange and white game. He'll probably play some guard as well. Um, you know, uh, Andre Carrick is already out for spring, and he's missing these opportunities, and that's unfortunate for him because he's a guy that started a couple of games at left guard. So, you know, we'll, we'll keep tabs on all that. But, I mean, you're going to see a whole lot of young tackles. Um, you're going to see Jesse Perry, Trevor Duncan, um, Larry Johnson, who's not really young, but you know, he was a junior college 
signee a couple of cycles ago, but hasn't really been a factor here. Um, you know, Lance Hurd's going to play, but I, again, I wouldn't imagine he play an awful lot. My point is you're going to see a lot of young guys getting in there and getting some reps. And so obviously, why do you want to put Nico behind them with a chance to get hurt or a chance to get hit? Um, so I'm, intri- I'm intrigued to see, you know, the offensive line, Bison Lang at center, Max Anderson, uh, William Satterwhite at center a little bit, Max Anderson at the guards. Um, intrigued to see what a lot of these guys, Gage Genther, continue to look like. And as Glenn Ellerby said earlier in the spring, man, I mean, it's baptism by fire. These young offensive linemen are getting their brains beat in by the defensive line, who is arguably one of the best units in the country. They're going to be better for it. So it might not look great. It might not look clean on Saturday, but these young guys are going to be better for it. Remember, and again, I'm not trying to compare this defense or this defensive line or this offense or anything, anything at all to the 1998 team that won the national championship. But there were people coming out of fall camp that had some serious concern and some serious worry that the offense led by T. Martin wasn't going to do a thing this year. Wasn't going to do a thing because they couldn't do a thing in fall camp because that defense was so good. Now, were they a record-setting, you know, high-scoring offense? No, but they were good, and they were good enough. Not only good enough, I mean, they were pretty good. They made some plays, don't get me wrong, but they went on and won a national championship. So, again, apples to oranges here. I'm not trying to say that that example is is fitting to this example, but the fact remains, I mean, it might look a little sluggish, but these guys are going to be better for it, in my opinion. The orange and white game MVP is going to be Gasson Moore. Why? Because, again, I said Nico's not going to play an awful lot. They're not going to put him in in jeopardy to get a hurt, in my opinion. I mean, he'll play, but I would imagine he's not going to play a lot. Gasson Moore is going to get a ton of reps. Jake Merklinger is going to get a ton of reps, and I'm excited to see the progression and the Jake Merklinger on Saturday compared to the Jake Merklinger that started camp as an early enrollee at the quarterback position. Gasson Moore is going to throw the ball all, all over the yard, and, and, and Tennessee is fortunate to have him come back. In my opinion, he's going to start the season as the backup quarterback as Jake Mer- Merklinger continues to come along a little bit. But Gasson Moore's going to make some plays because he's going to be the quarterback along with Jake Merklinger who plays the most in the spring game. He'll probably throw a couple of touchdowns. He'll make some plays on the run and all that. Deshaun Bishop, who is continuing along with Khalifa Keith to prove to the offensive coaching staff, Darrell Sims, new running backs coach, Joey Halls, the offensive coordinator, and of course, Josh Heupel, head coach, that they don't need to go get a running back out of the transfer portal. Deshaun Bishop's going to carry the football a lot. Khalifa Keith is going to carry the football a lot. Um, and then you got those wide receivers. I don't know how much Squirrel Wide will play. We know Brew McCoy is not going to play. I don't know how much Thornton and Brazel will play, but they're all probably going to play. And they've had a really, really good spring practice. Thornton has been the biggest surprise of that group. He's been really, really good. Chris Brazel has come along, incorporating himself into the offense, learning the schemes, the schematics, all that and more. Um, Mike Matthews, the true freshman early enrollee, has had a strong camp. Braylon Staley, though playing behind Squirrel White in the slot, has had a really, really good camp. Um, and then you have Chaz Nimrod and Caleb Webb, who were carrying themselves like veterans and who were carrying themselves like guys that say, hey, this is my spot. I don't want to give it up because they got a little taste of it last year due to injury. So I expect all those receivers to play, excluding Brew. Maybe not as much for guys like Squirrel and Thornton and so on, but I'm excited to see those young guys. Braylon Staley and Mike Matthews go to work. I'm pumped about that. And then the tight ends. Holden Sayes and Ethan Davis are going to play a lot. Ethan Davis battling a, a little bit of a minor injury, but you know a lot of people are. It's football. Holden Stays will be a factor of the offense, in my opinion. Miles Kitzelman, who's had a really, really strong spring camp. Um, one of the bigger, you know, Dante Thornton I mentioned was a huge surprise. Miles Kitzelman, one of the biggest surprises on offense as well. I'll have to believe it, or I'll have to see it to believe it, that Tennessee's actually going to play three tight ends. They've always said that they want to play three tight ends, but never had the luxury of doing so. It's been a two tight end system. Um, But I'm excited to see what Miles Kitzelman can do in this spring game. Um, So again, if you're looking for a perfect, clean offense, even with all these guys playing, it's still spring. They're not peaking. They're not playing their best football right now. That's not going to be the case. Josh Heupel would do away with the orange and white game if he had it his way. And a lot of coaches around the country would do the same because football coaches, number one, they're paranoid and that's fine. You know, they don't want to get anybody hurt and I get that, but they also think that they've invented the wheel that they know football better than anybody. And nobody's ever done a football concept like they have before. And they don't want to put it on camera. It just cracks me up every time that we're not allowed to shoot something at practice when it's a simple option drill or combination route. 
But nonetheless, excited to see football, um, excited to see offense. I know as an average football fan, as a casual football fan, you watch the ball, you want to see points, you want to see guys running with it and, and catching it and throwing it and finding the end zone, and that's awesome. And you're going to see that on Saturday. Um, but you're going to see gas and more lighted up. Hopefully you'll see Deshaun Bishop lot it up a little bit. Hopefully you'll get a big play from Dante Thornton or Chris Brazel or some of these guys and get them out. Hopefully you'll see some progression from these young guys on the offensive line to get a push on those veterans on the defensive line. We'll talk about defense tomorrow, but offense, it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be clean. The goal for everybody, especially some of these key players like Nico Iamaliava, get in, get some work in, and get out. And say that's all. That's all she wrote. Have fun at spring practice, and we'll move on to the next phase of the offseason. Um, we'll take a look at the defense coming up tomorrow on tomorrow's show. Uh, we'll take a look at the defensive line, the linebackers, the, sec- the new look secondary, all that and more. That is coming up as we continue on Lockdown Vols on a Friday show. But next, we'll have Ryan Shumpert of Rocky Top Insider coming to join Lockdown Vols. That's coming up next right here on a Thursday show. I want to tell you about our friends over at Game Time. Game Time is the app for you and for me, um, entertainment app, not just sporting events in your area, but concerts, comedy, monster truck rallies, whatever's going on at the Thompson Bowling Arena, the Food City Center. You can buy tickets for that event and any event in your area in Knoxville, wherever you're listening or watching the show, by downloading the Game Time app today. And by doing that and putting in the promo code Locked On College, you're going to get $20 off your first purchase. That's Locked On College, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-C-O-L-L-E-G-E, Locked On College, for $20 off your first purchase, or $20 off your purchase over on the Game Time app. It is safe, secure, easy to use, last-minute tickets, flash deals, zone deals. They have the lowest price guarantee, and I always like to go on other websites and other apps to see if I can find a ticket that is cheaper than that on the Game Time, and I can never find one. I really can't, but if I did, Game Time would supplement that because, again, it's the lowest price guarantee, even event cancellation protection and job loss protection as well. Go check out Game Time. Download that Game Time app. Create an account. Use the promo code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guarantee. Ryan Shumpert of Rocky Top Insider coming up next here on Locked On Vols. Ryan, I know it's been a busy time for you uh, finishing off the basketball season now into basketball offseason mode. You also cover baseball, but you're also there at football whenever uh, you know you get the graces with your presence for a little spring practice. Orange and white game coming up this weekend. I, I did in segment number one expectations for the offense in the orange and white game. What would your expectations be for Tennessee's offense on Saturday? Yeah, you know, expectations, I think, are almost hard to talk about when it comes to a spring game. I, I think maybe what you want to see more, you know, more than anything is just Nico look good, Nico look comfortable, um, him be in sync and rhythm uh, with his receivers. And yeah, I imagine a number of Tennessee's offensive linemen who have not been out there this spring will not be out there in a spring game. So, you know, I don't necessarily expect the offense to be clicking at you know unbelievable levels or anything like that and you probably wouldn't expect that at this time of year anyway but uh, I think everything starts with, with Tennessee's whole team but particularly with the offense with Nico and I think that's what more than anything the expectation you just want him to look sharp and it look him to look in command of the offense yeah of course you want to see Nico do a couple of things you want to see him play but you want to see him get out and stay healthy most most uh most of all, if I were to ask you who the offensive MVP would be for spring, and I love playing this game because it's always somebody that usually, you know, doesn't contribute a whole lot in the fall, and that's what spring's all about. Um, who would be the <laughs> offensive MVP in your mind for the spring game? I'll go with Deshaun Bishop. Uh, I mean, okay. I know he had a good scrimmage in the second scrimmage, but to me, that's almost, you talk about things to look for in a spring game, it's kind of an easy one in the sense that it's the skill position spots, which are obviously the easiest thing to watch anyway. And when you talk about the some of the injuries Tennessee has at running back, obviously with Cam Seldon um, and Peyton Lewis, the early and early freshman, Tennessee's kind of feel, it feels like they're in a spot where you, you're trying to figure out, all right, does Tennessee need to go get a running back in the portal to try to help with death, especially with Seldon's shoulder, you know, being a somewhat serious shoulder injury. And sounds like he'll be back for the season, but you know, maybe not full go necessarily at the start of camp either. So. Because or, of that, or, I mean, sorry have, to cut you off, maybe not week one or week two either. He'll be back for the season, but might be a little delayed as well. Yeah, so it kind of puts a, do you need to go get somebody in the portal? And, well, that leaves 
very basic opportunities here in spring practice for the guys that are there. Uh, Bishop being maybe the one I'm most intrigued by, but Khalifa Keith too. Um, and then if one of those guys can go have a big performance, maybe gives Tennessee someone else to think about and think, yeah, maybe we don't need to go uh, get a running back. So I think it's a big opportunity in you know, maybe more ways than one for some of those Tennessee tailbacks. And uh, I think Deshaun Bishop, a guy that, you know, Three weeks ago, if you asked me, is Deshaun Bishop going to have a big role on Tennessee's team this fall? I'd say probably not. Well, he's got an opportunity, and I think he's a talented guy. I could see him having a big game on Saturday. You covered him a little bit in high school. I covered him a lot in high school. The local legend out of Carnes. Um, it's cool. It's cool to see that. Hopefully he does well. Um, let's flip over to the defense. I'll talk more about defense on tomorrow's show, but you know, for me, it's like I, I know about this defensive line. Okay, There's like 14 of them. They're all going to play. You know, I like all them. Linebackers, it's like, sure, Keenan Peely, bubble wrap, get him in and get him out. I like to see Jeremiah T. Lander, Aaron Carter won't play, yada, yada. But it, the conversation's all about the secondary. Um, I'm so excited to see Jermon McCoy play, to see Jacoby Thomas play, these new guys, these transfers. Um, what about you? Um, it feels like they kind of have a pecking order at cornerback right now with Gibson McCoy and then, you know, Jalen McMurray, another transfer, and then kind of a bracket with Christian Conner and Jordan Matthews. At safety, it feels like it's Turrentine and Jacoby Thomas. Where's John Slaughter? It's Star, it's, it's Jordan Thomas, and then there's Boo Carter. Um, what, what are you kind of looking for defensively on Saturday? I think you hit the nail on the head. Like, I continue to think that maybe the linebacker room is maybe the most intriguing because I'm so high on some of the the young guys there but we kind of know who those guys are and we at least saw them some and Aaron Carter's not going to be out there so I don't necessarily think there's a ton of intrigue in the spring game for those guys and maybe when you look more at the season so yeah it's the secondary and uh, really to me it's the two guys you talked about at the star spot I mean Jordan Matthews and Boo Carter two probably the two guys in the defensive backfield I'm most intrigued to see because they're both really talented guys that we don't know for sure are going to have roles on this defense. Like, Jermon McCoy, excited to watch him. Ricky Gibson, excited to watch him. High on both those guys. You feel pretty confident about what those guys are going to be for Tennessee come the season. So, Matthews and Carter, two dudes with really high ceilings. How do they look? How do they fit? Uh, I think those are two guys that I, I'm really intrigued to watch. Closing thought on football um, as we get you set for the Orange and White game on Saturday. Man, you remember covering Tennessee spring practice when Josh Hopple just took the job. You remember a year later coming off a seven and five season, um, kind of getting you know really situated as the head coach of Tennessee. It just feels so much different now. The roster looks like a Southeastern Conference roster. Still, there's some deficiencies and they got to get better. And don't get me wrong, but it just feels like a world of difference now compared to then. Um, what's been maybe the biggest difference in those couple of years when you just look at the rosters right now? I think it's just the depth on the front seven, really. I mean, it's it's just so night and day. And the depth on the defensive line has been pretty good for the last two years at least. But it just feels different now in the fact that they're even deeper and they have a couple dudes that look like they could play in the NFL, which they really you know haven't had in some of those previous years. So you look at there, and then I think anytime you go back and think about that first spring in Heifel, you think about the linebacker room and how just decimated it was. Yeah. And uh, even with you know some injuries there with Herring and, and Carter, who's been running around without his helmet on doing some drills, even without those guys, it feels significantly in better shape. Uh, than, than it did that first year. And you're talking about two dudes that are going to be in the two deep. So uh, I think those are the two spots that I, I'd really circle. And, you know, one thing I'd point to, too, just as a whole, to further your point, it's just the staff continuity. I mean, even this year where they lose two guys on the staff and, and a running backs and inside linebackers coach, it just feels like everything has, has been very seamless in, in those transitions. And, and there's just a, a comfort level and an understanding and a kind of cohesiveness that – even in past staffs at Tennessee, even when they were there for multiple years, it just felt like there were so many moving pieces on the staff. Um, even in an offseason where Tennessee's had more you know, coaching turnover than they've had at any point in the Heifel era, to me that's still something that kind of stands out. We'll take a quick little timeout, breaking the action with our buddy Ryan Shumpert. I'll tell you about our friends over at FanDuel. It is playoff time in the NBA, in the NHL. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every single game. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, bucks, win or lose. You can bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks. 
all on the safe, secure, easy to use app over at FanDuel Sportsbook. You can go to FanDuel.com, put in the promo code locked on, FanDuel.com slash locked on to make your first bet an automatic win $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. 150 bucks, win or lose by taking part in the action. You're watching sports anyway, might as well put some coin in your pocket and you can do that easily on the easy to use, fun and exhilarating FanDuel Sportsbook app. FanDuel.com slash locked on to make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, it is America's number one sportsbook. More with Ryan Shepard of Rocky Top Insider happening right now. Ryan, let's shift gears now. Let's talk a little Tennessee basketball. Obviously, the season comes to an end. Elite Eight, most accomplished team in program history. Dalton, about said Dalton Barger. You know where my mind's at. Dalton Connect. um, All that stuff's great. But now it's off-season mode. You've got Freddie DeLeon that's gone to the transfer portal. You've got uh, two other ones, of course, most notably Toby Awaka. Um, you got five spots open. What's the next step for Rick Barnes in trying to replenish this roster heading into the first phase of the offseason? I'm laughing at the Dalton Bargo, Dalton Connect, because I same thing sitting there in post game uh, waiting to talk to Tony last night. I was referencing Dalton Bargo and I called him Dalton Connect. <laughs> so I've been in the same boat. That's a compliment for yeah. him, though. It is a compliment for him. Talk about two high level transfers. Uh, I'm not sure anybody's <laughs> quite Dalton Connect level. I guess Hendon Hooker is. Uh, but no, I mean, it's, I think right now it's a, a lot of evaluation uh for tennessee and the guys are going to target in the portal i mean we got the news on on wednesday kind of the first official visitor tennessee is going to bring in darlinson dubar uh from hofstra which to me fits to me the two biggest needs tennessee has is they need uh, a wing or a guard scorer um and then they need somebody that can kind of feel that josiah jordan james role is whether that's a a wing that has the versatility to play the four spot or just kind of a true st- stretch four and, you know, someone that, that allows Tennessee to stretch the court and play a lot of the same up-tempo style they played this year, which was kind of uh, a change in pace and a big reason I think their yeah. offense was a lot better. And, and Dubar is exactly that, a guy that averaged 18 points a game last year, shot, I think, hit 73 three-pointers on 40% clip. Uh, so he's a guy that fits that, and I think it's it's a lot of evaluation, as it was last week, and, and I think Tennessee's probably starting to solidify their board a, a little more and uh, find the, the needs that they have and then – uh, obviously, it's a lot of evaluation, not just from a basketball standpoint, but from a who fits in this culture and who fits at Tennessee's standpoint. So figuring out everybody that's going to be gone, figuring out what the needs are and going and attacking things, I think is where, where things kind of stand for Rick Barnes and his staff. Yeah, the cultural fit um, for his program, obviously you got to have talent, but if you have talent and, and you don't fit, they're not going to take you. Um, and that's something that Rick Barnes kind of prides himself on for sure. And there'll be new names that pop up, as you mentioned, the the you know, the – the pool is kind of getting more solidified for Tennessee basketball, but a, a big one coming up this weekend in terms of a visitor. Let me ask you about Toby Awaka, man. I, not to say he's not a loss because he brought a lot for Tennessee in his role, but does it feel like it's a bigger loss simply because he was a fan favorite? People love Toby Awaka and what he brought. Does that make sense? Like, Does it feel like it, yeah. it hurts more from that aspect when in reality he only played like, what, 13, 14 minutes a game? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I think it's twofold, and I think that's a big part of it. I mean, you're talking about a guy that averaged, you know, five points and five rebounds, and, you know, everybody's super, super upset. And that isn't to say, you know, I think Toby Walk's a really good player, and I think yeah. he's going to, wherever he ends up, I think he's going to have a good season next year. And if, if he can learn with to play without fouling, I think he's a dude that's a fringe, uh, you know, all conference big in a power five school, so, or power six school. So it's not to say that he's not good. But, you know, I think a lot of it is the fact that he he wasn't great for Tennessee last year, but he was a super likable guy. He was a fan favorite. Um, and so it, it hurts uh, from that standpoint. It hurts because he's a good player. But at the same time, when you talk about what Tennessee has, uh, with Jonas Adu, Tobey Walk, and J.P. Estrella, it just didn't feel, at least to me, all that feasible that Tennessee was going to get all three of those guys back just because the way those guys' games play, uh, it didn't to me it didn't feel like you could pl- play those guys together extensively you could play them together five to ten minutes a game or there's spe- specific matchups at work where you could play them a lot together but night in night out that didn't seem very plausible and because of that you know, there just weren't enough minutes to go around for all three guys and uh, I think from that sense a walk almost made the most sense to leave because Jonas Adu certainly 
going to be a starter and, and Awaka has waited his turn. He could step into being a starter somewhere. Whereas Estrella, I, you know, I think would be more comfortable stepping into that 15, 18 minute uh, game role. So uh, a loss for Tennessee, no doubt, not necessarily a shocking one and, and or a debilitating one, given what Tennessee still has in, in the interior on its roster. Yeah. And the way that Rick Barnes likes to play that stretch four and go small, you know, really kind of throws a wrench into the traditional play two big men, you know, getting all those minutes and everything. And, um, but right now, so you, you kind of run, ran that down. You got obviously Jonas coming back. You got JP, Kate Phillips on the roster. Not yep. that you need to go find a guy that's going to play big minutes for you, but in my opinion, you got to go find another big. Like that, that's, you got five slots open. One of those needs to be to go find a big man, at least to have another option on your roster, right? Yeah, certainly. They, they need to add a death piece, uh, no doubt. And, you know, that's where to me, a lot of the stuff in the transfer portal. It gets so difficult, especially in basketball, where it's, you know, you're trying to find someone that's worthwhile bringing onto your roster, but you're also, you know, it's it's not a spot to walk in that there's going to be a ton, a ton of minutes available for yep. said person. So you're, it's a less extreme version of the Tennessee backup quarterback, you know, conundrum of trying to find someone yes. that is a solid player, is worth a scholarship, can play for you. You can count on them to play 10, 10 minutes a night if you need to but it was also readily signing up for that. So it, it's hard to find, uh, but that's certainly a position that I think Tennessee uh, will look to add. And, you know, they currently have five scholarships to work with. I doubt they use all of them in the portal. I bet they'll try to take kind of a flyer on a uh, a preps guy as they have, feels like so often, obviously, just the guy Ziegler. Tobey Iwaka was one of those guys yep. uh, two years ago. So uh, certainly a lot of spots to work with for Tennessee right now. Yeah, but I mean, Ole Miss did it, so Tennessee needs to do it right now. Well, I mean, it's apples to oranges, right? Not not everything's the same. And I'm convinced, you know, this last offseason or two, whenever it was, Lane Kiffin wasn't like, all right, you're going to come in and back up this guy. You still want to come? Okay, no, it's going to say, you have an opportunity to go and play. That was the selling yep. point. And then, obviously, Jackson Dart ran with it, and he's the guy. Um, Spencer Sanders is that guy I was thinking of from Oklahoma State and, and somebody else. But nonetheless, it's easier Walker said Howard. than – Yeah, yeah. It's, it's easier said than done, as, as you pointed out. Shift gears again here as we conclude our little chat. Um, let's talk a little baseball. Um, in your opinion, I know at the time of this recording, things can always change. It's middle of the week, and hopefully you and I both will find more information out as we get closer to first pitch on Friday. But will A.J. Causey throw that first pitch on Friday? He's been so good for Tennessee, stepping in for A.J. Russell, who remains sideline. But the last two outings, he's gotten rocked. Um, do they make a change this weekend? If so, what's that look like in your opinion um, or do they just kind of steady the course and give him another try? Yeah, no, I think entering the week, I would have said I thought they'd give him another shot. Um, but, you know, after we talked to Tony Vitello earlier in the week, it feels like that's up in the air. I mean, I think Tennessee's still trying to figure out what they're going to do. And we saw Kazi warming up in the bullpen um, there in the late innings uh, against Alabama and m on Tuesday and almost felt like they were going to get him a bullpen session in the game, maybe try to get some confidence back. So uh, I could really see it going either way. I still... You know, I still lean towards Tennessee hoping Causey gets them a lot or a number of innings on Friday, I should say. I don't know. That might Maybe that's not in the starter role. Maybe they use an opener and try to kind of slot them into a different spot. Um, but, you know, if I had to guess here at time of recording, I think they'll they'll try to get him uh, to get him a handful of innings in that opener. Yeah, I agree. Um, if he's – I mean, I'll continue to ask people this week, but if he doesn't start Friday, he's going to – Best case scenario, I mean, he's going to pitch three, four, five innings out of the bullpen. I mean, he's going to be a factor for you. It's just trying to get that confidence back up and trying to get him back dialed in because, I mean, he can, he's proven that he can pitch in this league. I mean, his first two weeks in SEC play were pretty solid, uh, but nonetheless, got to get him back on track. Um, last question, and I had this in my 3 2 1. You used to write those 3 2 1s over at ballquest.com. Just for fun, man, who is Tennessee's best hitter in the lineup? I, I kind of went on a little, little monologue Gosh. one through five. Just not fair. Six through nine is not bad either, but one through five is not fair. Simo, yeah. Burke, Amick, when he's in there, he's healthy. Amick, um, Tears, and then Dryling. Who would you want in the box with the game on the line? Or, if it's easier to answer this way, if you're an opposing pitcher, who do you not want in the box with the game on the line? Well, I think you asked me two different questions because you say the game on the line thing, I almost go Dylan Dryling because he's just so good in those clutch moments and he just seems so True. composed. Uh, when the game, I mean, that a bat he had at Alabama on Sunday, which didn't end up mattering, but he works the basis loaded walk against that lefty that Alabama threw in there that was just throwing filthy stuff. I mean, he made both, uh, I think it was Tears and Robin Villeneuve look really bad. And yeah. 
Dryling was just fouling off two strike pitch after two strike pitch and worked the walk. Like we've seen that so many times. Obviously, the Vanderbilt home run last year. So he might be the guy in game on the line moment, but best hitter, I think it's Blake Burke. I mean, what he's done this season is just so, so impressive. And just rounding himself out is a truly, truly complete hitter. Uh, I mean, to go from, you don't even, to me, I don't even think about the home runs anymore. Like he yeah. certainly he hits a number of them, but I think of the doubles, I think about the fact that you just feel confident he's going to put the ball in play. If it's a situation where there's a runner on third and, and less than two outs, you feel like he can go opposite field just as well as he can go poolside. He's been so, so impressive this year. And I think when you talk about his rounding himself out as a complete hitter and everything he does, uh, when you add that power, it's been noticeable since the day he stepped on campus. He, he's probably the guy in a very crowded group. He is probably yeah. the guy that I would give the nod as the best Tennessee hitter. You know, that that's who I answered as well. I would say Blake Burke, but you're exactly right. It is almost kind of two different questions. Like if the game's on the line, the clutch factor, the Kobe factor, I mean, dryling, it's hard to say no to him. He's getting yeah. drafted this summer for sure. Um, we'll see what happens. Tennessee baseball hosting the defending national champions, LSU Tigers, this weekend. A different club, but still a very talented club. And and you and I both will be over there covering that. Ryan, what else you got coming up at Rocky Top Insider this week? Yeah, tons of stuff. We'll have everything that's uh, going on with the, the Tennessee men's basketball and the transfer portal and the offseason. We've had plenty of content from Kim Caldwell in her first week on the job and uh, obviously a lot of excitement there. And then spring game, orange and white game on Saturday, we'll have coverage from previews going into this weekend series uh, against LSU and complete coverage uh, for all three games. Always appreciate my buddy Ryan Shumpert over at Rocky Top Insider for joining the show. Give him a follow on Twitter. He's rshump00. Does great work along with Rick Butler, Jack Foster over at Rocky Top Insider. And uh, be sure to follow their work and encourage them as well. But uh, really appreciate it for Ryan to, uh, to jump on the show as he always does. A regular contributor here on the show. And talk a little Tennessee everything. Tennessee football, spring practice, baseball, basketball, all that and more um, right here on the show. So that is Ryan Shumpert. Give him a follow on the X account. Hey, when we come back tomorrow to conclude a week's worth of Lockdown Vols, we took a look at the offensive side of the football today, expectations and what we need to be looking for for Tennessee's defense in the orange and white game. That's what's coming up on Friday's show, plus getting you set for the weekend, the latest in Tennessee basketball and the transfer portal, all that and more happening right here on Lockdown Vols. Appreciate you guys. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday, everybody. <laughs>